Welcome to Driving the Line, the pursuit of safety, where we talk about the real issues out on the road, focus on safe driving, and learn industry best practices from your hosts, Kenny Ray, Mike Bohan, and Jim Seibert, in the hopes that by driving the line, we get more drivers home safe and sound. This podcast was made possible by Marsh McLennan Agency. Welcome, everybody, to Driving the Line. This is Mike Bohan, and as always, I'm in here with my co-host, Jim Seibert and Kenny Ray, and we're ready to talk some truck safety with you. And today, we're going to be talking about the FMCSA's data queue system, what it is, how it works, some best practices. But before we jump into that, gentlemen, how was your week? I know we got a lot going on. We're always on the road. Did we see anything interesting, do anything interesting? Just kind of want to know how we're doing this morning. All's good in Texas, Mike. Trucks are rolling and uh, looking forward to enjoying the fall weather and just out there doing our thing. Absolutely. Doing our thing. I know we're busy. I know Jim and I, we've been actually, I got to see each other a few times here recently. It's always nice when our paths cross out there on the road somewhere. But uh, Jim, what have you been up to lately? As usual, just chasing the kids around. Uh, we got chickens playing in the front yard and... Uh, you know, traveling around, seeing customers, doing some safety audits. And yeah, it's it's good to see you guys when we can cross paths. Absolutely. And we do appreciate our listeners. Uh, we love it when we get to get out and see our clients when we're on the road. Um, and, and we certainly appreciate you joining us today. And and uh, let's jump into to data cues. So data cues, is, it's a federal system, an FMCSA system that allows motor carriers and drivers or somebody who represents them, the ability to request a review of their data. So what does that mean? Well, when your driver or in your truck gets stopped for an inspection, all of that information from that inspection gets uploaded into the SMS system, including driver information, truck and trailer information, USDOT number, and definitely any violations that are written during that roadside inspection. And of course, the violations, that's what drives your CSA basic scores. So there are times when uh, an inspection takes place out there on the road and there may be inaccurate information that's entered into that inspection report. So motor carriers and drivers can submit a request for data review, which is an RDR, and the request is sent either to the state enforcement agency for review or to the FMCSA, whichever is appropriate. And the RDR will then be reviewed and they'll make a determination on whether or not changes will be made to the inspection or to the data in question on the inspection report. Because that's what we should be submitting as motor carriers is those requests for data reviews is for incomplete or inaccurate information. We don't want to just be challenging everything that comes across our desk when we get an inspection. It's truly, is it is it incomplete or is it inaccurate? Does it belong to us as a motor carrier? Is this my truck? Is it my driver? Um, did we feel like there was some inaccurate information or incomplete information? That's what this data queue system is for. That's why we submit these RDRs. Now, there's a couple of other major areas where a request uh, for for a data review w- would come into play, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. But before we do that, I, I really want to kind of just bounce around with some best practices when it comes to submitting an RDR, that request for data review, for a violation on a roadside inspection. And I know that, and Kenny, you jump in on this because we see this often. It's for me, when I when I see this come in, I get a lot of questions a lot of times, um, and I'll just give you examples of things you may not want to challenge. And that's um, things that if you just don't agree with the violation itself, it's not an inaccurate use of the violation when it comes from the roadside inspector's uh, standpoint. The motor carrier just may may, may not agree that 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 uh, regulation or that violation should even exist. That's not something we want to challenge. Right. I mean, it's just it's in place. It was written correctly. We don't want to challenge those things. We don't want to just send in everything that that uh, that really comes across on our roadside inspection. So we're looking for the inaccurate or incomplete. So how do we do that? What are some best practices? And I don't know, Kenny, what, what's some things that you tell your clients when they're submitting uh, a, a challenge in the data queue system? What are some of the points that you tell them to hit on as far as what they're submitting to this enforcement agency that wrote this violation? Well, you hit the main thing, and, and it's something I stress all the time. 
is let's don't challenge something just because we have a philosophical disagreement whether or not it's a good law. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll see something on a roadside inspection. You'll say, oh, that's a piddly little thing. You know, I had a marker light out. Well, okay, you may not agree that that should be a violation, but the fact is your truck was stopped and you had a marker light out. So, you know, it's not that the, the information's inaccurate or the information's incomplete. It's just that you don't think that that should have been on the report in the first place. And, and Mike, you, you hit the, uh, a point about this, and, and I think you would agree. We don't see this as much today as we did when the program first started. But when, when the FMCSA first started letting people challenge violations on roadside inspections, we had a few companies, and, and they were always in a minority, but they oftentimes were a pretty vocal minority. And they, ju they, they, they adopted the philosophy, we're going to challenge everything. If, if I get a roadside inspection, I'm going to fight every single thing on it. Well, we don't see that as much anymore, but every once in a while, somebody will still decide whether it's a, it's a principle uh, of theirs or they just are in a foul mood or whatever, that they're just going to contest everything that's found on their truck during a roadside inspection. And and I think two things comes out of that. Number one, they're not going to be successful. It's going to be denied. The challenge is going yeah. to be denied because the violations did occur. But the second thing, and I know we have a lot of trucking companies that listen to our podcast. And if anybody's out there, whether they're an owner or a safety director or who that's, that's responsible for the challenges, just know this. It's kind of like that that childhood fable about the little boy that cried wolf. You you can complain so many times that eventually people won't take you seriously. And and so what what will end up happening is when you have a legitimate challenge, uh, you, you're already behind the eight ball on it because the agency you're submitting to, I'm not saying they keep a list of people and they would ever take any kind of retaliatory action, but you've lost a lot of your credibility up front because they've seen a pattern of frivolous challenges that had no merit whatsoever. And so then when you come along with one legitimate, you almost have to build that credibility back before they'll even take you seriously on a challenge. So I, I think that it's excellent. You started off mentioning the fact that the only violations that should be challenged are ones that either were not a violation the trooper just made a mistake, and, and and every once in a while that happens. It's relatively rare, but it does happen. Um, and and some of the classic ones. Let's say they put the, the they they enter the wrong USDOT number. It's not even your truck. Clearly, mm -hmm. you want to challenge that. Um, or they um, you, you've got an inexperienced in, uh, inspector. They're in their training phase, and they just they just get something wrong. Those are the things we want to challenge, but just not because you don't agree with, with the merits of a law. Let's don't go down that path because it, it's counterproductive for everybody. It wastes everybody's time, and ultimately, you're not going to be pleased with the results. So I pulled some numbers from the FMCSA's a and side about just the calendar year of 2022. And they said there were 2,767,771 inspections in the calendar year of 2022. Wow. With over four and a half million violations written. So when you're talking about on a rare occasion, an inspector is going to uh, going to make a mistake on an entry, uh, you know, whether it's the DOT number or a violation or something like that. We're talking about a lot of data points there yep. that could where we could have an error we could have an inaccuracy we're all human we all make mistakes it's 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 going to happen but that's what this program is for is for those very few times when there are those inaccurate or incomplete um, instances we've got the ability to have that reviewed and the correction made because that then that will reflect on your sms site it'll it'll they'll adjust your scores if it's accepted and, and it's a it's a valid challenge in the data queue system um, and Kenny, you mentioned a point which brought to mind a, uh, a company that I've worked with. They had, uh, we were going through their inspections uh, at one point and we found a, we found an inspection in, uh, that took place out in California. This company doesn't operate in California. Right. Wasn't their truck, wasn't their driver, but you know what? It was a clean inspection. There were no <laughs> violations. Well, the owner said, ah, we're going to keep that one. And I said, <laughs> 
no, 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 no. We don't want to yeah. be associated. We don't know anything about that company. We don't know anything about that truck, that driver, whatever. I said, we have to challenge that and we've got to get that off. So that was an instance of we weren't trying to get rid of a violation. Yeah. We just wanted the information on their site to be accurate because it was not their truck, was not their driver. And I think there was like one digit on their USDOT number that yeah. was wrong or something like it was something weird like that. So it it happens. It it happens. But when you do have that instance of of okay, we've got an inaccuracy or we've got something incomplete. And when you're going through the challenge, you're going through the process on it, make sure that you are fully aware of what the violation is that you got, what the regulation is that you're in violation of so that you can be really accurate in your challenge. You know, if it's something that you feel like we need to challenge this, make sure you know what the regulation is. Educate yourself there. If, you, if you're not sure what it is, reach out to a risk consultant talk to your safety director, whatever the case may be, whatever the situation is, and make sure you understand the situation because what, you know, what you don't want to do is, is, is challenge something that you, that you don't understand. So make sure that you got a base, you understand what's going on and then be really clear and concise with everything that you're doing. And in the data queue system, it'll walk you through a process of entering data and, and submitting proof of, well, here's our claim, to why this violation uh, should be overturned or why, you know, we've got an inaccuracy here. Make sure you've got good documentation. Make sure you're really clear and concise in what you're asking for and what you feel like happened. And, uh, you know, and, and then be able to submit that information because it, it's it's rare that you see a data queue challenge accepted or um, or taken into consideration and, and a violation overturned when it's just submitted and say, well, we don't feel like we were in violation of this submit that's that's going to get denied it's like kenny exactly. said that's going to get denied it's just not going to work you've got to you've got to build your case um you've got to put that time in and and again when you're writing out your narrative be very descriptive and and what happened and and then have the documents to back that up when you're submitting your request for data review it's just it's just really important that you do that because honestly at least from my perspective these requests for data reviews shouldn't really happen all that often it's a great tool to have, though, when there are those instances where you need it, right? Mike, before you leave that point, um, you reminded me of something. The, um, I've seen motor carriers, for whatever reason, and this is an internal system failure on their part, I've seen them where a driver would get a roadside inspection but wouldn't turn it in and and or would tell the, the motor carrier, hey, I got inspected, but for whatever reason, the company did not get a copy of the actual document that the trooper handed the driver. And, and I, I, I'm, the point I want to make is you need that because in Absolutely. a lot of states, the officers, there, there's narrative portions on that. And I know at least in Texas, the officer will make notes about what he saw. If all you're doing is going into SMS, and getting the summary of a roadside inspection, you don't get that information. So it's very critical to actually have the, the physical document that your driver got issued during the roadside inspection. Because what I've seen, Mike, and, and you add to this if you want to, I've seen where a driver would, would tell the company, hey, I got stopped, I got inspected, uh, and wouldn't somehow the driver would either say, well, he didn't give me anything, or I lost it, or whatever, and so the company, the safety director, would go into the SMS, print out that summary you can get, which is, again, only a summary. And then what will happen is the, the safety director will be working off of that summary and what the driver told him happened. Mm -hmm. And we're only getting part of the story like that. And then they go in and they try to do a challenge in the system and it gets denied. Now, one thing I want to uh, I, I remind people of, we're in an era today where everybody's got cameras, including law enforcement. And you need to understand if your driver claims that the trooper did something or said something or, or told him it really wasn't a big deal, and you base a data queue challenge off of something your driver told you, just know this, the trooper has video proof of what actually happened out there on the side of the road. And if it gets to the point where he or she needs to show that to their supervisor and say, here's what actually happened. And here's the violation I saw. Just know this. There is a recording of it somewhere where the roadside inspection has been captured on video and law enforcement holds that. So be careful about 
just basing a challenge on anecdotal information that your driver tells you what happened out there, particularly if you don't actually have the roadside inspection and are looking and are seeing the notes that the inspector or the trooper put on the roadside inspection. Yeah, I, I would say probably, and I, I don't know, Kenny, wouldn't, wouldn't you say just about every enforcement agency that's doing inspections like this, they're going to have that video, but if they write a violation, they're probably taking a picture of it and documenting yep. that. No I doubt. Mean, I, I, I don't know of any, any organization that I work with that's, that's not doing that now. Yep. I mean, it's, if, there, if there's a violation, they're taking a picture of it, you know, they'll mark it with a chalk, you know, if it's a crack in a leaf spring or something like that, they're going to mark it with chalk and take a picture of it. I mean, it just, so then they've got that record as well. So yes, things are being documented and you bring up that point about getting that, that roadside inspection when, if it's not turned in, because you can, like Kenny's point was you, you can get a copy of that in this data queue system. Um, also on uh, kind of on the flip side of that is if you're not getting it from your driver, there's a requirement that you retain those roadside inspection reports for 12 months. That's right. And if you're not getting them and the FMCSA, your state uh, McSat partner comes in and does an audit on on your company and you're missing a bunch of roadside inspections over the last year, it's going to be a violation for your company on an audit. So that's Absolutely. kind of a twofold thing there that uh, th it's really important that you get those. But yes, you can pull those from the data queue side. So, and what we're talking about things that carriers challenge a lot. I mean, most of the time we're looking at, uh, you know, things on the truck, things on the trailer, things like that. But it's, um, there's, there's a good way to, to put yourself in a position for success where you don't have to challenge these and that's not have the violations in the first place. Right. And Jim, I know, you know, we were talking about this earlier, you know, it's a good, a good maintenance program or, or you know, good pre-trips, all that stuff. That's, that's really important because we're talking about challenging something if we've got inaccurate or incomplete information, but there's some violations out there. You, you may not agree with on the roadside inspection. Well, how about we don't get those violations, right? Yeah. Mike, Kenny, you guys, you guys have probably seen way more reports. Uh, I shouldn't say probably it's an absolute. You guys have seen more reports than I have. And from data queue, my assumption is the majority uh, of these challenges are equipment related, right? The inspection lights, tires, brakes. It's, it's, it's that uh, horse inspection analogy here that, um, it's more beneficial to not have to go in and, and pull the report. And how do we do that? It's by not getting the citation in the first place. And uh, when we see equipment that needs to be inspected, whether that's through our daily vehicle inspection um, and it coming back, work orders generated, mechanics out there fixing, turning wrenches, um, getting those pieces of equipment ready to get on the road. Uh, so, just like any inspection, any regulatory authority coming in and, and looking at you, you've got to do it, date it, document it. Uh, documentation is the key here. And um, maintenance, it's just imperative in, in this realm. And so I guess that's my thoughts. I, I agree 100%. I mean, it's and we've talked about that in, in, in previous podcasts, the, the, the importance of the maintenance programs for for the motor carriers uh, out there and the importance of drivers being able to do good inspections and, and communicating between the driver and, and the company and, and vice versa about um, uh, things that are going on with the truck, with the trailer, that kind of thing. So I, I think it's it, it's vital. This speaks to um, this gives us an option, you know. Uh, but as I said a little bit ago, um, it's not something we should be using every day for sure. I mean, it's just that we don't, we don't manage our safety by data queue. That's, that's not, that's, that's not the goal. Uh, we want to have good solid practices in place and that's, that's all across the board, all of our safety practices. And that includes our maintenance program for sure. Well, the second area I wanted to bring up, um, when we're talking about requests for data reviews and our, our data queue system is the FMCSA's adjudicated citations policy. So if a driver receives a citation uh, that's associated with a violation on a roadside inspection and the driver goes to court and the citation is reduced or it's dismissed, uh, the driver can then submit a request for data review through the data queue system, along with copies of the court documents and, and the inspection details and all of that. And if that happens, then one of three things could be the outcome. So the first one is, if the result of the adjudicated citation 
is that it was dismissed without a fine or they were not guilty in the driver's PSP and on the SMS system, the violation is going to be removed. It's going to be gone. If the result is there's a conviction of a different charge, which let's say you had a um, an excessive speed violation of 15 or more mile an hour over the speed limit, the driver went to court, got it reduced um, to a to a lesser charge. What's going to happen is the violation uh, is going to be indicated as convicted of a different charge. It'll actually show that in the SMS site, and then the SMS severity weight for that violation is going to be reduced to one. So that's the second option that could happen out of this. The third one would be if the result of the adjudicated citation was either a conviction or it was dismissed with a fine, the violation is going to remain as it stands, as it was written. So that's the three options. So we see this occasionally. Um, you know, a lot of times it's with uh, speeding violations, things like that. A driver might go to court and get it reduced. Um, this is an option that, that you have. Um, my question for you guys is, and I talk with my clients about this quite often is let's say that you have a driver that was going 25 mile an hour with speed limit or 15, maybe it wasn't even that much. It was just 15 or more with speed limit. And, and he gets a citation that coincides with that violation on that roadside inspection report. He goes to court, gets it reduced. Your policy says we don't, we have zero tolerance on excessive speed. What are you going to do with that driver now? Because on the violation, well, I got his violation reduced. He went to court and got it reduced. Does that mean that that driver was not going 15 or mile an hour over the speed limit? Or, you know, how do, from a risk management standpoint, we've got the ability to challenge this, you know, through this process, but we got to look at this now and say, oh, we've still got an issue here that we got to deal with. And I don't know, Kenny, do you run across that with, with your clients and what do you tell them? Yeah, absolutely. And and Mike, I, I'm not familiar with how the courts work in Missouri and Jim. I'm not familiar with how the courts work in Oklahoma, but in Texas, this is very common. A truck driver will get stopped for speeding and uh, he, he or she will actually, now let's make sure because we're comfortable with some terms that sometimes people in the industry aren't. We're talking about in addition to a roadside inspection. So your truck gets stopped for speeding and the trooper does an inspection plus they write a ticket, an actual judicial citation to your driver. So in addition to the roadside inspection, they actually get a summons to contact a court, contact a judge to appear in court. So we're talking about that portion now of the of actually getting a ticket. And it's very common in the state of Texas where a driver will go into uh, our lowest level court, which is called Justice of the Peace Court, so where all class C misdemeanors are found, which are uh, all traffic violations in Texas. And they'll say, can I take defensive driving? Can I have deferred adjudication? Which means if I'm a good boy for the next six months or the next year, this goes away or gets reduced. And the courts will work with people sometimes and that charge will actually get reduced. So what you end up fighting or what you end up dealing with through the, the data queue system is the reduced charge. But the question that you're asking, Mike, and I think it's a profound question, and I think it's one trucking companies need to have a firm foundational belief about what, how they're going to handle it. It doesn't change the fact that that driver was driving 15 miles an hour over the speed limit. And if you doubt whether or not he, she, he or she was doing that, we go back to our conversations just a few minutes ago. 100% of police cars, at least in the state of Texas now, are all equipped with video cameras, yeah. and it captures the radar data as well. So you want to challenge the original ticket, the highway patrol is going to show you how fast that truck was running. So your guy was speeding. So however you deal with the data queue, and, and, and that you've been talking about, Mike, the core issue is here, you've got a driver that's violating your company policy that was driving in an unsafe way. You know, uh, as a motor carrier, you've got to make the decision how how firm are we on our uh, are we on our policies? And I think you're on extremely shaky ground if you say, well, it got reduced to this, and so our policy dealing with this is, you know, it got reduced through a judu judicial maneuver, not because he wasn't doing the original, not because he wasn't act. doing it. Right, that's exactly right. right. Yes. So I think that's very dangerous ground. You know, it's that old adage you hear all the time. It, it's better to have no policy than to have a policy you don't enforce. Yeah. 
because that's what it's going to look like. I mean, that's un- unfortunately. Talking about that policy real quick, you know, a, a policy of this nature reaches across multiple uh, companies and industries and having a, a firm and fast policy is great. Uh, if you're following it, Kenny, just like you said there. Um, and, and I agree, sometimes it's it's better to not have one than it is to have one. Um, however, more and more, um, the requirements for having one uh, prove themselves. And the zero tolerance policy, I that term has been used and, and thrown out and it's, it's just become standard language. Zero tolerance policy doesn't mean that termination is the first step. And so in, in dealing with our drivers here, uh, there, there's a list of things to weigh or factor in what's that driver's transparency? What's the honesty of the situation? Are they bringing that to you? Well, that could de-escalate our zero tolerance policy. We could have other things previous to termination, like driver training, like uh, defensive driver courses that we implement or we require on those drivers that that have these moving violations um, the one thing I think that I would highlight the most, all right, if you've got a policy, a zero tolerance policy, that's fine. But your approach to how that policy is used, it's got to be uniform across the board, right? Yeah. You can't have somebody mm-hmm. that went 15 right. miles an hour over and we're going to have them do do one step. And then the next driver comes in and they're 16 miles an hour and we're going to terminate them immediately. So whether you've got it or you don't, I think that it's good to have it, but making sure that we're we're applying those steps based on the the after action uniformly and and having that really spelled out uh, in in the policy itself. I agree too, and and it's important that that your employees know that you know when they when they get on board and they're going through that process that that they're aware of of uh, any policies that are corrective action or disciplinary policies that you've got in place. So great point, Jim. Well, finally, guys, let's talk about one last aspect of this. And and, and this is one of the areas that I think is uh, very, very, very beneficial uh, to all of our motor carriers out there. Let's talk about the crash preventability determination program. So, I mean, this is just to me a fantastic step forward when it comes to DOT recordable crashes on anybody's SMS profile so it gives the motor carriers the ability to challenge a crash if it meets the eligibility criteria. That's that's the key. And it kind of along the same lines we were talking about with challenging any uh, any violations on inspections or anything like that. When it comes to these DOT recordable crashes that are on our profile, you may say ah, it, it wasn't our fault. We want to challenge this, but it doesn't meet one of the eligibility requirements. Well, you don't want to challenge that if it's not meeting the eligibility requirements. And I know I just said, people say a lot of times it's not our fault. We don't really talk in terms of fault, not at fault. We talk in terms of preventability and non-preventability because that's what they're going to determine these crashes as. So when we when we look at this um, from a standpoint of, of managing this, and I talk to clients about this all the time, especially if they've got any DOT recordables, I say, let's get your police reports let's review these and see if they meet the eligibility requirements. And if they do, let's get them challenged because what that'll do is it will remove those, uh, the, those DOT recordable crashes. You'll still be able to see them on there, but it'll remove those points off of that crash basic and uh, your, your percentage will come down. So that's, that's what you're after. So this is a great tool to use. It's been in place for a few years. So any crash after uh April 1st of 2019, they can be challenged again if if they meet the eligibility requirements. And an example of a crash would be if if your truck is is either stopped or driving down the road and it's rear-ended by another vehicle that was traveling directly behind them uh, and they failed to stop at the time. That's an example of a of an eligible crash. And there's there's really good guidelines that they have on the uh, the data queue site. This crash preventability termination program, they've got a, a crash type eligibility guide. I've got it right here in my hand. It's a PDF document. You can print it out. Your safety director should have a copy of this. So when this happens, you can get a copy of your police report, which you will absolutely need if you're going to challenge one of these crashes. Um, it's one of the you, you cannot challenge a crash if you don't have that police accident report. 
And uh, you take a look at it, you look at the officer's narrative, you look at the, you know, all the details and, and the, the information that's in that crash report, and you compare it to the the eligibility guide. And if it if it matches, then that is a a DOT recordable crash that you can challenge through this process. And and I think it's just it's it's a great program. And Kenny, you've done a lot of audits. I know, uh, you know, over the years, we you know that what we used to call compliance reviews, and I did too. I mean, when you go in, how many times did you hear that? It's like, well, this crash, yeah, we got hit. I mean, years ago when this when this program wasn't in place. I mean, I heard that all the time from motor carriers. It's like, well, yeah, we've got a crash on there, but it wasn't our fault. Somebody blew a stop sign and ran into us. You know, yeah. it, how is that being held against us? Yeah. You know, you mentioned the benefit. I, I, I think this is the, and I mean the meaning exclusive. I think this is the most beneficial thing that the Federal Motor Care Safety Administration has done for our industry in many, many years. Uh, this has been a phenomenally good, positive program for trucking companies. Well over 90% of the crashes that are being challenged are being submitted for review, for preventability, as long as they meet the eligibility guide. And you, you talked about that. Um, well over 90% of them are being found to be non-preventable, which means they're ruled in favor of the motor carrier. Um, so it, you know, this, this is a phenomenally good program. And I want to say shame on our industry. If you're not using this, because you're the one that's losing the benefit of that. And you mentioned that the points will be taken off of CSA in their, in their, uh, crash basing. That's true. It also, and you and I both are, are old auditors. It also means that the, the, the crash can't be used when they're calculating the, uh, the accident rate. Uh, for the factors on on a, a compliance review, so it benefits the motor carrier in a couple of ways. Uh, the only caution I would have uh, about this is, <clears throat> and you mentioned looking at that police accident report on every crash report in the United States. Now the format of them's a little different, but they all contain basically the same information. And there's going to be a field somewhere on that crash report where the officer gets to assign what are called contributing factors. And you need to look, you need to, number one, you need to read the narrative. You need to look at the diagram and you need to find the field on that uh, crash report that shows contributing factors. And if the officer put any contributing factors on your driver, you do not want to challenge that because the officer that investigated said your guy had at least some contributing yeah. uh, factors to the crash. And if you do that, and, and, and know this, if you submit one for determination and it meets the eligibility, FMCSA is going to issue a determination. It's either going to be preventable or non-preventable. And again, fortunately, the majority of them have been in favor. I'm, I'm going to say roughly 93%, but that means about 7% of them are actually getting a ruling against the motor carrier. And guess what? That gets posted on your SMS yeah. side. Yeah, so, everybody sees that. Uh, yes, and you don't want the federal. You talk about a plaintiff's attorney's uh, dream come true if the federal government steps in and says, basically, y'all could have prevented this crash. Uh, I mean, it's just the kiss of death. I, I don't know why anyone would even take the chance of submitting one unless they're not absolutely confident of how the ruling's going to go. Absolutely. Well, for the safety directors out there, even drivers, whoever, anybody listening to us, if you want to look and see what crash types are eligible, go to the data queue website. Um, you can print it. They've got a lot of good information on there. You can, you can print this off and, and kind of walk through it. Uh, it's got a lot of information on it about what's eligible, what's not eligible. It's got some diagrams, things like that, but uh, it's a good document. It's a good, it's a good document to have. It's a must have for safety directors or whoever's in charge of challenging um crashes or inspections anything like that uh at your at your company it, it's just absolutely must have print it out or save it on your desktop you know quick reference guide it's it's a really good document to use and i will say this so we've got that to work with but uh the fmcsa they published a, a federal register back in april of this year uh proposing some changes to this crash preventability termination program and i and I, i'm not going to go into all the details of that you can pull that federal register up and read through that um, if you're bored and got nothing else to do, but it's got the information on what they're proposing in there. But one of the things I want to bring up and I thought was very interesting 
the very last point in in what they're uh that they're, some of the follow-up crashes they say and i'm going to read it verbatim what it says in a photo register it says any other type of crash involving a commercial motor vehicle where a video demonstrates the sequence of the crash events or the events of the crash so the fmcsa said that it believes that the submission of videos could allow it to review crashes that are not in the 21 other types. So if you are a motor carrier that has video event recorders, you've got dash cameras, you've got video evidence of a crash that you know was not preventable by your driver, but it does not fit into one of the buckets that they've got. One of the, one of the really strict eligibility criteria is, but you've got the video evidence. The FMCSA is proposing now they'll take a look at that and say, yeah, it doesn't meet one of the specific areas, but video evidence is pretty clear that this driver could not have prevented this crash. I think that's a big a, a, a big point that they put in there. I, I really do. It kind of speaks to how the, uh, the industry is moving, the technology that's being used. And, and I know everybody's got their different viewpoints on, on video event recorders and dash cameras, things like that. Um, but I feel like the companies that are using them to protect themselves, to protect their drivers from things like this, this is going to be an added benefit for them. You know, if they're involved in a DOT recordable crash and they would like to challenge it, but they don't feel like it's, you know, meets the specific criteria. If if these proposed changes go through, then now it could be reviewed and, and we could take a look at it. So that means really any crash that they, you know, DOT recordable crash, they feel like was non preventable. It could hit on that point. So I think that's a big deal. It, you know, I know it's a proposed change, but uh, that's something that they're working on. They're trying to expand this program and uh, get it to where um, it's including more types of crashes and, and, and more information because it's a good program. As Kenny said earlier, I think it's, it's going to be extremely beneficial as we go through in the future, just as it has been over the last several years since it's come into place. Um, I'm just really happy that, that we've got that option. I feel like that, that we've got a lot of information that we've provided for you here today. Um, just to kind of recap, we, we've, we've hit on the data queue challenges with just violations on a roadside inspection. Uh, we, we talked about the adjudication, uh, adjudicated citation process that you can go through drivers and companies can go through and then we talked about this crash preventability determination program so there's a lot of information there if you've got questions on that stuff please reach out to your uh your your risk consultant talk to your safety director see if they're aware of this information gather some info because i feel like there's a lot of good stuff here for you but it's 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 important that we understand one that we don't manage our safety program by the data queue system. It's a tool that we have to have more accurate data and more accurate information as we go forward because that's what we want. We don't want to try to you know circumvent the system. What we want is just accurate information. We want accurate data. So, uh, Jim, any parting thoughts? Uh, any uh, wisdom for our listeners out there? Nothing to uh, to tack on to what you said. Uh, I think that this is a pretty rich episode here with a lot of good uh, best practices and, and a lot of information. So just encourage the listeners, yeah, reach out to your uh, uh, your risk consultant and um, we'll we'll walk you down this road if if it's a little bit unfamiliar to you. Well, I feel like that wraps up this episode. Uh, tune in with, with us next time. Uh, we're going to be talking about the hazards of driving while you're drowsy. So I, it should be a good episode. Um, it's something that we don't talk about a ton uh, in our industry, but it's it's very important because it's uh, it can be it can be just as dangerous as operating while you're under the influence uh, in a, in a lot of ways. I mean, folks folks get tired, and, it, and it's kind of a dangerous situation. So tune us tune in with us then. Uh, until then, for all of us at Driving the Line, stay safe, and we'll see you next time. That's all the time we have for this episode of Driving the Line, The Pursuit of Safety. We hope you enjoyed our discussion, and thank you for listening. You can rate, review, and subscribe to Driving the Line, The Pursuit of Safety on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or any other app you're using. You can also follow Marsh McLennan Agency on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. Until next time, thanks again for listening. Drive safely, everyone.